Shields up, Ironbreakers, and welcome back to Dragon's Dogma 2. Capcom was kind enough to send me a review copy, and I've been playing the game over the last couple of days. Now, naturally, I also plan on streaming Dragon's Dogma 2, so in order to preserve that first playthrough experience, I focused most of my time on learning mechanics, exploring the open world, getting a feel for the starting vocations, and beating the ever-living crap out of every monster I could find. Now before we begin, I feel it's important for me to explain exactly what you're getting yourself into when it comes to Dragon's Dogma 2, as this isn't your traditional modern RPG experience. Dragon's Dogma 2 is an open world RPG with some survival sandbox elements, absolutely no hand holding, limited fast travel, and some of the best RPG combat and class fantasy you'll ever experience. Each quest is an adventure that will likely involve emergent gameplay, which means things might happen which will interfere with your objectives. And these things won't be scripted. Sometimes they might be minor inconveniences, while other times they'll straight up wreck your day. And that is both the beauty and the beast of the world of Dragon's Dogma 2. For example, you might be required to deliver a message to a faraway town, and you choose to take an ox cart. There's a chance the ox cart makes it there safely, you deliver your message, quest complete. But there's also a chance your journey is interrupted by a cyclops that destroys your ox cart, leaving you stranded in the middle of nowhere at nighttime, which coincidentally also happens to be when some of the most dangerous monsters roam the land. Unlike most recent RPGs, you don't just get a dodge roll that lets you avoid everything. Each vocation, which is this game's version of a class, has unique defensive mechanics you'll have to master. The fighter blocks, the thief dashes, the warrior straight up tanks the damage with a shoulder barge, mages levitate in the air. Each of these abilities has its nuances and requires a certain degree of mastery. Taking excessive damage will lower your maximum hit points, dying will lower your maximum hit points, and there is only one save file with two stages. That is, the autosave and your last in rest. Adventuring will require planning and preparation in the form of consumables, camping gear, and maybe even party composition. Food also decays over time and loses its benefits. Weight is an incredibly important mechanic and limits the amount of things you can carry, how fast you move while carrying them, as well as your stamina regeneration, which dictates your combat effectiveness. Some quests are timed, so if you don't pay attention, you'll fail them, and they are not repeatable. Important NPCs can die, and their potential content dies with them. The resource to bring them back to life is limited, as is the amount of time their corpses will remain at the morgue. These are some of the more punishing features of Dragon's Dogma 2, but it is important to remember that this is a design choice, and it is designed like this to ensure that you will have a unique experience as you explore the world. But now you ask me, is all of this worth it? And the answer is, absolutely. Dragon's Dogma 2 delivers really cool class fantasies with its vocation system. My first encounter with a Cyclops as a thief had me climb up to its head, plant an explosive, jump off, detonate said explosive mid-air, which caused the Cyclops to lose balance, use my ensnare ability to throw a grappling hook and pull on his legs to secure a topple, and finishing off with a critical blow to the head. My first encounter with a pack of goblins as a warrior had me impale one of them with my massive two-handed sword, lift them off the ground, and yeet them into a nearby wall, which was absolutely satisfying. Even spell casting actually feels really good, and I generally don't tend to like caster characters. Changing vocations to try different playstyles is an absolute blast. You'll unlock new passive abilities that can be used across vocations. The world is absolutely gorgeous, the combat is phenomenal, and the sense of adventure when you go on a new quest is incredibly immersive. In fact, this is likely one of the most immersive games I've played in recent memory, and I can't wait to start playing it properly with my permanent character in Pawn tomorrow. <laughs> Silly me, I didn't even mention the pawn system where you'll get the fully customize your ideal companion that will also have access to multiple vocations and will accompany you on your adventures. The pawn will also be recruitable by other players and earn valuable knowledge as he goes on his own adventures. And before you ask, no, there is no multiplayer. I know, I know, I wanted it too. 
Anyway, with that lengthy intro out of the way, let's jump into some specifics, starting with visuals and animation. From a visual standpoint, Dragon's Dogma 2 is absolutely gorgeous. It's going for a hyper-realistic aesthetic and absolutely nails it. From the moment you set foot in the world, you will be completely immersed. You'll want to explore every nook and cranny and take it all in, because with these visuals and animations, the team was able to create a believable world that I simply cannot get enough of. The day-night cycle, the lighting, the vistas, it's just breathtaking, really. Animation-wise, you'll really feel the weight of your weapons or the power of your spells, as well as the impact of a huge monster as it butt-slams you into oblivion. They've also made use of ragdoll physics in some situations, which is really great. I love shield-slamming goblins around, or even impaling them with a big two-handed sword and yeeting them into a wall, or simply blowing them up as a thief. It's great. However, these gorgeous visuals do come with a bit of a cost. I played the game on PC as well as PlayStation 5 to check what performance is looking like, and my experience was a little rough around the edges. Both my PCs feature beefy Ryzen processors, 32 gigs of RAM, and NVMe drives, so none of these components is going to be a bottleneck, which leaves us with the GPUs. One of my rigs is rocking a 6900 XT and the other one a 7900 XTX. The 6900 XT struggled to run the game at a steady 60 FPS even after I lowered the textures, shadows, and cranked up FSR3, which is AMD's equivalent of the LSS. But even though the game runs decently outside of town, once I go into the first main city we're looking at heavy fluctuations that sometimes go below 30 FPS. I could sacrifice the visuals some more, but I really don't want to. On the 7900 XTX, the game runs fine after I knock the shadows down a smidge, but again, FSR 3 is enabled. The performance was simply not there with FSR 3 off, which is a bit of a red flag. Naturally, a lot of you will say AMD issue should have gotten an NVIDIA, and to that I say I'll let you know when I feel like making a bonfire out of money because the NVIDIA 40 series were, maybe still are, ridiculously overpriced when I was building my last PC. Now, when it comes to the PlayStation 5, the game was running at 4K. I don't really know if it is native or checkerboard upscaling or what the situation is there, as I don't really have the tools to analyze that. But I did notice some of the textures were at a lower resolution, which is normal for console hardware and didn't really strike me as jarring. There's currently no performance mode and the frame rate was at around 30 FPS. I did notice in some pre-rendered cinematics they upped the frame rate, which was a weird decision. So all in all, the visuals are gorgeous, but performance was struggling a little pre-launch. And I say pre-launch because I believe the team is still working on optimization, so by the time this video is out, the situation might have changed, but I will be streaming the game, so feel free to stop by the stream and check for yourself. If your system is on the lower end of the hardware requirements and you have high standards for your performance, you might want to wait and see if things improve or at least check reviews from someone who has a system closer to your specs. But fundamentally, are the performance issues a deal breaker? No, not to me. Even if PS5 was my only option, that would be fine. In fact, performance was actually more stable overall on PlayStation 5, but naturally the frame rate was mostly around 30 FPS. Moving on to sound, this is top notch. Monster roars in the distance sound great, metal carving into flesh, metal clanks, explosions, and the skull cracking sound of a cyclops smashing his face on the side of a mountain, absolutely excellent. The soundtrack has been pretty good so far, as well as the voice acting, although I already know some of you will get tired of pawn banter, which is interesting because apparently one of the pawn specialties you can get makes them speak less often. Not a whole lot really to point out in this section, it's all very immersive and sounds good all around. I'm not gonna go into great detail about the story, as naturally I want to avoid spoilers, but also I actively avoided the main quest to preserve my first playthrough experience on stream. What I did experience of the story so far has me really intrigued, as there's definitely more focus on that aspect of the game than in the first Dragon's Dogma, but beyond the main story, I'm really curious about just general character interactions, which seem much more meaningful than before, as well as the consequences for your actions based on in-game events. 
For example, if you just follow the main story thread at the beginning of the game, the game flow will naturally take you to the first main city. However, in my very first run, the guards that were escorting me to the city died while we were fighting a cyclops, so I wasn't granted immediate access to the city and I had to find a different route to gain entry. Another example had me help someone who then granted me a discount in a relative store who had a quest item I could buy for another quest which eventually culminated in me getting a couple of items that were being sold for hundreds of thousands of gold for free. Anyhow, let's jump into the meat of this video, the gameplay. Dragon's Dogma 2 gameplay is quite a unique open world RPG experience. As I mentioned in the intro, there's almost no hand holding. There are tutorials that explain the mechanics of combat and overall world systems, but beyond that, you're pretty much on your own. Should you make a mistake, like allow a character you're escorting to die, that character is dead, unless you're willing to take the hit of losing progress in favor of reverting back to the last time you rested at an inn. Should you venture out unprepared, chances are you're going to have a bad time. The absence of simple fast travel will force you to come up with strategies as to how you navigate the world and make crucial decisions as to whether or not you should engage in certain combat scenarios along your journeys. It is however also important to mention that a lot of these elements become easier over time. As you level up and become stronger, killing enemies gets easier and as you accrue more currency, you'll be able to purchase fairy stones for teleportation, deploy port crystals to create fast travel locations, and more solutions will present themselves. But that's precisely what makes the game special. The world itself feels alive. A journey between where you are and where you're headed is a self-contained adventure, and because monster behavior is not scripted, there's so much that can happen each time you head out. NPCs also have their own agendas and motives, and they don't just necessarily stay in place waiting for you to come and pick up their quest. They're out and about, doing their own activities and will pursue their own goals with or without you. In terms of combat, think of a mix between Monster Hunter and Shadow of the Colossus, but with a unique spell casting system included. Any vocation can grapple and climb up monsters to deliver devastating blows on weak spots, but naturally this is more of a melee mechanic as spellcasters often benefit more from staying at a range. Same thing for archers and magic archers. There is no universal dodge roll. Each vocation has its own mechanics, and mastering said mechanics is the only way to ensure victory. Each vocation also has synergistic values for other vocations. For instance, sorcerers work well in pairs, as they can make use of dual spell casting, which is a mechanic where two casters can focus on the same spell to reduce cast times. Most vocations will be able to benefit from having a mage in their ranks for elemental weapon buffs and heals. Thieves will benefit greatly from having a fighter or a warrior in the party to gain aggro so that they are free to hit weak spots unimpeded. You'll be expected to form and lead a party of four. You'll control your main character and create a main pawn which levels up alongside you, and you'll also be expected to manage his gear and skills. For the remaining two members, you'll be able to rent out the main pawns of other players. If you're playing offline, the game will generate random pawns for you to recruit. During combat, you'll be able to provide basic instructions like Go, which causes them to spread out and attack nearby targets, To Me, which causes them to stay closer to you during engagements, Help, which is self-explanatory, the pawns will run to your aid and assist you in any way they can, and Wait, which causes them to stop attacking or take no action. Your character will also be in the thick of it, leading by example. Your attacks will feature varying degrees of animation commitment. Naturally, thieves hit faster and can move more, where warrior has to commit longer to charge his big two-handed swings. Mages need to find positions where they can safely cast their spells, and so on and so forth. Each vocation has its own unique playstyle, but all vocations will feature four equipable skills from a list of quite a few more, allowing for a certain degree of customization based on personal preference. They'll also have a class unique mechanic and their own combos, but things are significantly different from the original Dragon's Dogma, where for instance, Anodyne was a healing spell that was for all intents and purposes a skill, whereas in Dragon's Dogma 2, Anodyne is simply your triangle input when playing a mage, so it won't even take up a skill slot. The combat will then consist of your party working in unison to take down monsters and various foes you encounter along your path. 
The potential interactions between your pawns and your main character can generate quite the unique combat scenarios, from warriors constantly staggering enemies with their heavy blows, to fighters grabbing aggro and potentially getting grabbed themselves and yeeted into oblivion, to thieves deploying blasting powder embedded in the monster's weak spot, to sorcerers bringing about the apocalypse to murder a lonely goblin. It's incredibly satisfying. But naturally, it all comes with the inconveniences of managing your inventory, stamina, and overall party health. And speaking of stamina, another really cool aspect of the combat in Dragon's Dogma 2 is that there is no mana and skills and spells don't have any cooldowns. The only resource you're going to have to worry about is your stamina, which regenerates fairly quickly. However, you have to be careful about your stamina usage as it's also used to run. And should you completely deplete it, your character will enter a vulnerable state wherein you move slower and can't perform actions while recovering. Now, personally, I find the whole experience quite unique. But then again, I've been singing the praises of the original Dragon's Dogma for over a literal decade now. So naturally, I'm not the most impartial person when it comes to this particular franchise. Dragon's Dogma 2 provides a unique experience both from combat as well as a roleplay and even storytelling perspective. It's not trying to appeal to the masses. It knows exactly who its audience is and it is catering to that audience. If you don't like the inconveniences I've mentioned in this video, I'm not sure this is going to be the title for you, but I genuinely believe we have something special here. And if you're still undecided at this point, I really hope at the very least you watch some gameplay to understand what you are missing out on, and who knows, maybe in time you'll be willing to take the plunge yourself. Now me, I can't wait to jump in properly myself, and I hope I'll see you guys in the streams. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing for more Dragon's Dogma 2 content. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.